Well, I invite you, if you have your Bibles with you, to turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Today we're finishing up our series through the book of Isaiah. Today, considering the gift of Jesus, which is grace. As you turn there, I'll pray. Let's bow our heads together. Our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for all of the souls this, this morning that have uh, committed themselves to you through their baptism. And we pray now, Lord, that as we open up your word, your spirit might teach us that we don't just hear the words of a mere man or man's imagination, but we hear directly from you through your word for Christ's sake. Amen. Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we would look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows." Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed, uh, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide in the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is God's word. Well, with the explosive growth of online shopping, likely many of you, if you're like me, you absolutely despise going to Target or anywhere else this time of year. Um, so we go to Amazon Prime and things like that, and we're seeing uh, with the explosion of that a new form of crime that has also been increasing, especially at Christmas, where we see more and more package thieves. That is, these people that saunter through neighborhoods or they drive around and they take whatever packages uh, the UPS guy or the FedEx guy might have just dropped off at your house. Well, I'm sure that many of you have likely seen the video that this one man who is a former NASA engineer made a bait box, basically, for these people that were stealing packages. And when opened... It not only would it videotape you, it would spin out a significant amount of fine rainbow glitter. I think I laughed at that video far, much harder than I thought I would, or maybe not, a, not hard enough at all. But either way, the justice was fun to watch. The best part of the whole thing for me was the three to four seconds of stunned silence that occurred immediately after the glitter bomb went off. You see these people, they walk up to the porch and they, they take the package, they're driving, and the, and the thing's videotaping in 360 degrees. And then the guy puts it on his lap and he takes the top off and he goes, woo! And all the glitter just goes everywhere. And he's going... I think I just rewound and watched his face three or four times. I'm like, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Now, I, I only assume in those three or four seconds of stunned silence that these people were rethinking their life choices. My assumption is that there are no package thieves here. If there are, stop. But there will come a time when all of us at some point will fail somehow. Maybe not as publicly as others, and maybe not with a lap full of rainbow glitter, but there will come a time when we desire to have a new record. 
when we want to, when we stop and re- we rethink our life choices, what am I doing with my life? What have I done with my life? Sometimes we want grace. Sometimes we want a do-over. But we can't because it's impossible to go back and make different choices. And if you're like, well, glitter bombs are a little too lowbrow for me. Thank you very much. Well, we can go to Shakespeare, can't we? You can go to Lady Macbeth. And she's trying to wash the, the, the blood off her hands out damn spot after she and Macbeth killed her husband. And Macbeth is off to the side with the doctor. And he's like, and I'm paraphrasing. I'm not going to give you Elizabethan English this morning. He's like, can you help my wife? Can you go in and pluck the memories from her head? Can you go and take these sorrows away from her mind? And what does the doctor say? The doctor says she has to minister to herself. And I think that's the answer of most generations, especially our generation. We'll just minister to ourselves. Booze and pills and pot and entertainment and overwork and romance and achievement. But these things, of course, are only temporary toxic solutions to a permanent problem. They're like a dirty band-aid that we apply to a broken arm and think we're doing something. But therein lies the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you were to take all of the miracles of Scripture from Genesis right to the book of Revelation and stack them all together, as great and magnanimous as they are, none of them, none of them are as great as the miracle of God justifying the ungodly. Jesus walking on water, absolutely amazing. But nobody gets hurt. Not even Peter. Peter doesn't even get hurt. But when God justifies those who do not deserve to be justified, the whole moral order of the universe gets turned on its head. Why is that? Because of our sense of justice. Because we believe if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. You get a lap full of glitter or whatever it is. And so many approach this book, the Bible, and think, well, it teaches that God punishes bad people and rewards good people. So in in order to avoid hell and get to heaven, I need to be good, I need to do good, and hope that that's good enough when I die. But the Bible doesn't teach any of that. In fact, the Bible, Jesus flips all of that right up on its head. In its pages, it teaches us that God justifies the ungodly. He extends grace to the undeserving. The Bible says that we are all sinners and fallen short of God's holy standard. There are none good. But God gives us Jesus' perfection through faith, and that is called grace. And so here, Isaiah is explaining to us how that happens. You see, the justice of God, the perfection of God, demands that sin, which is cosmic treason against God, must see justice. And we're no different. People say, well, I don't think God should punish people who sin. But we're not any different than that. We demand justice, don't we? If not, we wouldn't laugh at a guy making a glitter bomb for for people sealing his packages. No, God's justice, however, is perfect. So the question is, how does God make us right? How does he justify us? How can God love us? Well, in order for that to happen, someone must stand in our place to take what we deserve and to give us something we do not deserve. So let me give us five little steps through this chapter. Here's the first step. This will be our first heading. I want to ask and answer what is the question, what is grace? We'll start by defining this term. What does it mean that God justifies the ungodly? It means that God treats bad people as if they were the one and only good person to ever live, Jesus Christ. That goes beyond any miracle. Actually, that's a scandal. God wants to glorify Himself by flooding our lives with the sin-bearing mercy of Jesus Christ. The only barrier to this renewal is when we cling to our own righteousness, meaning we think we're good enough. Well, we don't need God. Well, you know, I'm good. I'm I'm certainly not as bad as the other person that's sitting next to me. But in reality, when we start doing a frame-by-frame of our lives, we realize that we need the perfection of someone else. Not only that, someone must take our guilt. And so some would say, well, then to be a Christian, you need to be sweet and nice and kind and honest and always smiling. Look at some of y'all out there. You're like, eh. Those are good things, right? But the problem is, in our desperate and futile attempt to hide our true selves, the true self that always isn't sweet and nice and kind and so on, we end up wearing masks. So we build up layers and layers of of outer, what we would call goodness. 
But to truly uncover the person, they need to come before Christ. And the only way to do this is in the context of grace. In the reality of our existence, this will happen eventually to every single one of us. The Bible says it is appointed for a man or a woman to die once and then face judgment. In other words, you take your last breath here and your first breath, you'll be standing before God in judgment. We don't have to wonder what happens after we die because Jesus tells us we will take one last breath here and the next breath will be standing before God. What do we do? What do you do in that moment? There's no mask left. There's no fake left. It's just who we really are before God. And so we either come to Christ as our Redeemer now or we face Him as our, at our judge at the moment we take our last breath. I typically run into... Two types of folks in my journey through life. It's pretty fun because back when I was in finance and somebody got to know me, they didn't care if I was in finance. But now, when I meet somebody and I talk to them for a couple of hours and they say, oh, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, I'm a pastor. And they're like, hub, 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 hub. and they're wondering, what have I been talking to this guy about for two hours that's going to make me go to hell? And I'm like, dude, chill down. I don't have that type of power. You need to calm down. And so they sit up straight and they start using proper English. And I'm like, calm down. And then they'll say one of two things to me. The first is that they'll say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Yes, it is. And in fact, that's why we're here. We're here because we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. It's not of us. We all do what we don't want to do and don't do what we want to do. And then we tell people, don't do this, but then we do that. What is that called? A hypocrite. But that's why we're here. And then I tell people, there's always room for one more, dude. We're constantly going against our own confession of faith, aren't we? And then the, the, the second one is the old line. Somebody says, well, I can't go there. The building will fall down. <laughs> it's like the dad jokes of not going to church. And then I slap them. But both in love. But both of these people miss the message of the gospel. They're completely missing the message of the gospel. Grace is unmerited favor. The radical message of the gospel is this. No matter what you've done, no matter what you're ashamed of or who you are, God loves you totally, unconditionally, and without exception, based on what Jesus has done for you. God gives us through faith in Christ the perfection of Jesus. How is it made possible? through what Jesus has accomplished. We are right to say we are not saved by works. We are saved by faith. But in reality, we are saved by what Jesus has done. The works of Jesus, if you will. His perfection is given to us. So what did Jesus do for us? That's what Isaiah is telling us. Here's our next heading. Here's what the first thing that Isaiah tells us he did. He was rejected. Verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As from one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. A common question I get is this, how do I get my family member, loved one, or whoever else to come to know Christ? And the answer is you can't. God might use you in your consistent walk with Jesus, your proclamation of the gospel, maybe even your baptism, to draw that person to him, but it is God that does the saving. And the same is true in our lives. To break the faith barrier, to embrace Jesus as Savior, we are enabled by God with faith to believe. That's what the Bible teaches. Paul stresses this for us in Ephesians 2. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. So we need God's help to believe. Because the truth is, we're far more superficial than we realize. We're far more sinful than we want to admit. Human nature is really to only look on the surface of things, to judge on outward appearances. But Jesus doesn't try to impress us on that level. It says he was a root out of the dry ground. A people, uh, the people he came would not accept him. The miracles, he, he didn't have the effect that we think they might have had because some would not believe. His own family misjudged him. you got to stop watching these movies that show Jesus as like this perfect guy from Iowa with Kenny Loggins' hair, and he's glowing, and he's dressed in white, and all the disciples around him look like rabble. And Jesus is like, oh, oh. That's not what Isaiah is telling us here, is it? The woman at the well thought he was just some guy. 
He didn't, she didn't say, hey, nice hair, man. Where'd you get those white robes? You're glowing. She was like, who are you? Stop. Anyway, there was nothing physically impressive about Jesus. Even John the Baptist was uncertain about him. Jesus was not special in ways that count to us. In fact, in his crucifixion, he became hideous in his sufferings so that the people shunned him. He was the one from whom men hid their faces. Why did Jesus sink so low? Why did the living word, the one through which all things were made, allow his own creation to beat him, nail him to a Roman cross outside of a city where he was worshipped for generations? He was rejected so that we could be accepted. He became like us so that we might become like him. That's grace. The second thing, or or the next heading, Isaiah says he bore our sin in verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. What did grace cost? It cost Jesus everything. Isaiah is writing as if we're all standing there before the cross, seeing all of this take place, because we were. If it wasn't your guilt and your sin that required the death of Jesus, if it wasn't my sin and my guilt that required that he die, if it wasn't that, then then what did require that he die? Jesus was a man of sorrows, but they weren't his sorrows. He didn't deserve them. They were ours. In a way that we don't really understand, Jesus was our substitute. He he didn't die on the cross to show us how to love one another or love our neighbors or be kind and bear one another burden, although he did teach those things. His death on the cross was eternally more. He didn't die as as an example to us, but as a substitute for us. God has done something on the cross that we could never do. He shifted our eternal weight of sin and guilt from us to Jesus Christ. And the big theological word that I love for this is called imputation, which is, it comes from a Greek word, which means charging to someone's account. He took our sin and he charged it to Jesus' account. God demands justice, just like we do. God is not a cosmic sky grandpa sitting on a cloud that looks down and goes, look at you and you're thin, you're cute. Here's a lollipop. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is holy and righteous and perfect. So, sin has to be dealt with. It has to be put right. So you either die and spend an eternity away from God in a place that Jesus calls hell, so that when you take your last breath here and you stand before God, you are cast away from Him. Jesus says, into the outer darkness where there's much weeping and gnashing of teeth. Or, or, Jesus takes hell for you. Isaiah says, however, that we are all like sheep that has gone astray. Instead of looking to Jesus for the payment that he's already made, human nature is to try all kinds of home remedies and trinkets and mantras and all other things that are completely useless to deal with our sin the way that Jesus already has. We used to go to church with this really sweet lady in New Hampshire. Wonderful person. But she was the queen of the nastiest home remedies in the world. And so I wasn't in ministry at the time. It was before all of that. And, but I would do my best to never sniffle or cough or do anything around her that would indicate that I, I felt at all per, other than perfect. Because the moment I did, she would go out to her car and, she, I, mean, I, I don't know, she'd get like a, a jug of orange juice and a bag of onions. She'd come in and she'd, she'd demand that you eat them right there in front of the whole thing. This will cure you. <laughs> it's going to do something to me. I don't know what was going to happen. I never did it. But we do the same thing with our sin and our guilt. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. But hey, wait a minute. Let me go grab the onions and the OJ out of my car. Because I can do it on my own. Let me get all the new age trinkets and the latest garbage bestsellers that are at Barnes & Noble. If you go into Barnes & Noble in the Christian section, just keep walking. Because it's all garbage. The majority of it is just trash. 
But look at what God has done. Believe what God has done. Trust what God has done. Jesus has taken it all. This is what grace cost. He bore our sins so that we would not have to. The next thing Isaiah says is that he died innocent. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. The death of Jesus was, is the biggest miscarriage of human justice ever. But it was Jesus' own clear-headed choice. Jesus did not die because he was unable to rescue himself. He was still fully God, although he was fully man. He was not overpowered. He was not incapable of taking himself off the cross as he was accused of. He just chose not to fight back. There's no way he deserved what he received. Well, what does that mean? It means that if you die apart from Jesus, you're guilty. And Jesus says your eternity is hell. A literal separation from the mercy and love of God are forever. But Jesus, the completely innocent, took your hell upon himself. How did God take an eternity of hell and pour it out onto Jesus? I don't know, but he did. And that is why I worship my Savior, because he did. Jesus is fully man because only man could take the sin of man. And Jesus is fully God because only God could survive the wrath of God and return from the grave three days later. Only the innocent can cover the guilty. And the empty tomb proved that there was, no, there was more to his death than anyone realized. He paid our sin debt in full. He died innocent so that we might be declared not guilty. Then Isaiah says he was crushed. Verse 10. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put him, he put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The the death of Jesus was much more than a, a, a human plot. It was the divine plan of God. Jesus knew what he was doing and he knew it was the will of the Lord and he was not embittered by it. He didn't scream at his tormentors. He didn't blaspheme against God. I mean, think of it this way. The Romans perfected torture. And the lowest form of their torture was the crucifixion, or the highest form, depending on your point of view. It was human sin that led the Romans to create this device. It was their own torturous sin that perfected it. It was the sin of man that held Jesus nailed hands and feet to the cross. Yet it was all in the line of this evil and sin that God used, that Jesus used, to make himself an offering for you. To take the wrath of God. Sin upon sin upon sin, God redeems it for you. God redeems this torture to redeem you. This is why he was crushed, so that we would be victorious. Isaiah says, he shall see his offspring. Who are they? It's us. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord to be saved. The world perceives the followers of Jesus to be weak in body and mind and nothing more than goofballs. That's not new to this generation. It's been that way since the first century. Jesus said they would hate us because they first hated him. But through Jesus' cross, we are enriched beyond all measure. We possess all things worth possessing. We are victorious over Satan, sin, and death because of what Jesus has done. And so you might be thinking, so what? Who cares? There's football on later. Wrap it up. What does this all mean? It means it's Christmas, friends. The grace of God found in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the greatest gift of Christmas. It is the gift of Christmas. It is the true meaning of Christmas. What are you doing with it? Well, you will respond in one of two ways. The first is, I don't want it. I don't care. It can't be true. It can't be that simple. Surely there are rituals and rites and good deeds. I got to join the thing. I got to do all this other stuff. I got to be nicer to people. I got to do all these things. But in fact, you can never do enough to outweigh your sin debt. Joan Baez, if you remember her, she sang that song, Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. But if you listen toward the end of it in the recording, right at the end, she goes, If only it were that easy. She didn't believe what she was singing. Well, it wasn't easy. Isaiah isn't painting a picture of ease, is he? 
The suffering servant did the most costly thing ever. He suffered the hell of God's holy wrath against sinners rather than bearing it themselves. That was not easy. Belief in Jesus is not easy. Following Jesus is not easy, at least not for now. The gospel, however, is addressing a deeper question for us. How do we get right with God? How do we make amends at the level of God's infinite justice? Well, the gospel answers is that Jesus already has for us, and God is satisfied. And the message comes to you, and you either take hold of it by faith, or you say, no, I'm a New Englander, I'm all set. The other response, then, is that we believe the gospel. We begin this eternity-long journey of walking with God through Jesus Christ. And when that happens, when we come to know Christ, we stop believing our own propaganda about how good we are. Listen to me, you might look out at your yard and say, well, that pile of dung in my yard ain't that tall. Look at the pile of dung in my neighbor's yard. We're all from Tennessee, apparently. Look at the pile of dung in my neighbor's yard. My pile of dung isn't as tall as his. I'll tell you what, man. Your moral superiority is nothing. Absolutely nothing. My moral superiority is nothing. Because we revere Jesus crucified for sinners and receive His grace with the empty hands of faith. So friends, I'll end this way. If you are an unbeliever, admit that you've gone too far to get yourself out because you have. Let Jesus take your guilt and God will never bring it up again. And friends, if you are in Christ and we're just a few days away from Christmas and you need refreshment and you need, you need just something in your soul, go to Jesus with your sin. If you are in Christ, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do not live undefeated this time of year. God willing, don't bear those sins one moment longer. Because mercy at the cross is great and grace is free. We need to find our peace in Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray and we'll be dismissed. Our God, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, for those of us who have been walking with you for some time, that we would be drawn closer to you over the next few days. That we would be refreshed by Christ. That as we gather with our families to open presents and to eat, we would first be reminded of the gift that you've given us on the cross. And friend, if you sense God calling you to himself, do not harden your heart. I offer you a prayer and you can pray it in your own heart. And as you do, cry out to God for salvation. Dear God, I now realize that I am more sinful than I ever before would admit. But now through Jesus, I realize I am more loved than I ever before could believe. Please save me now for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us online today. We believe that the church isn't just a Sunday service, but it's a family where you belong. If it's your first time tuning in, we'd love to get you connected to our family. One of the best ways to do that is to fill out our online connect card. Head on over to friendshipbc.com connect. Let us know if we can help you in any way today by sending us a message on Facebook. Be sure to connect with us online on Facebook, Instagram, and our website to stay up to date with everything happening here at Friendship. Thanks for joining us.